Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Turn the Page. I am your host today, Jen, and I am so delighted and so honored to be here with a fantastic author of a historical fiction that I just could not put down. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cody Epstein, uh, and my new novel is The Mad Women of Paris, uh, coming out on July 18th. Thank you so much for joining us and for, um, you know, bringing this book to my inbox. I was <laughs> approached by the publisher and I snatched this one up because it just hit so many of my interests. I love historical fiction. I love the history of medicine yeah. uh, and I love particularly women's experience of medicine. And so, mm-hmm. so many of my uh, historical interests are are presented here. Um, but before we were to get into the book too much, I was wondering if you could tell me about your journey to this book. Uh, When did you start writing uh, and how did you get interested in this topic? I started writing it, or I guess I became interested in the topic well before I started writing it. Um, I think it was right after uh, I had sort of my last book, Wonderland, had come out and I was trying to sort of toss around for the next subject. And I, I don't really understand why I was doing this. It was a couple of years ago. It was like, I guess, three years ago. But I started researching uh, Victorian death photography, um, which is obviously not this subject, but it's its own thing. It's wildly fascinating and, and um, macabre. And, and um, you know, I sort of had it in my head. I was like, well, maybe maybe I could do something about a death photographer. And I don't know why. <laughs> I don't really know what I was thinking. But I was going through pictures of, of clearly very not alive people um, you know, being photographed by the Victorians to try to sort of remember them, you know, for one last one last image before they're sort of um, gone forever. And then I stumbled upon an image of a young woman who was very clearly alive. I mean, just just strikingly so. Um, it was the same era. It was sort of, I think, 1870s, 1880s. And uh, she was sort of contorting in a very dramatic fashion against a black background wearing what looked like a sort of nightgown. Um, and I, I just thought, well, what, it was so surreal um, and so unlike anything I'd seen before that I immediately switched gears and started researching that. And I found out that um, her name was Augustine Glies and she was a hysteric, uh, had been diagnosed as a hysteric um, and was um, a uh, interned or, you know, um, had been committed to the Salpetrier Asylum in Paris. And uh, there was this whole world that kind of revolved around what at the time was seen as the hysteria epidemic, um, not just in Paris, but really worldwide. Um, And the doctors at the Salpetrier, which I, I quickly realized were sort of medical icons in and of themselves. One was uh, Jean-Martin Charcot, who was widely regarded as the father of uh, modern day neurology, um, had done extraordinary work in terms of identifying other other disorders, including ALS and Parkinson's. And in the last chapter of his life, decided he was going to turn his attentions to hysteria and try to solve that for the public in the same way that he had these other two previously very mysterious diseases. And he was also a mentor to this whole stable of incredibly impressive men who would go on in their own rights to be super influential, most um, namely Sigmund Freud, obviously, although he was there very for a very short period. It was the experience had a hugely profound impact on him. He ended up naming his firstborn child after Charcot mm-hmm. and uh, others like uh, Georges Gilles de Colette, G- Gilles, Gilles de la Tourette, who was um, Tourette's syndrome. So the first Tourette syndrome is actually named for Tourette and a whole bunch of others, Joseph Babinski. So I I kind of found myself switching rabbit holes and going down the rabbit hole of 19th century hysteria in Paris and learning a little bit about what the disease was thought to be, how it was manifested, a truly spectacular, almost um, unbelievable array of of symptoms, um, symptoms that these women displayed when they were when they were having their fits and how these were interpreted by the male medical establishment. So that kind of got me launched. And from there, it was really just 
swimming around in this often daunting and baffling, but always fascinating material, trying to sort of figure out where the story might be and what kind of a story I could tell that would um, be compelling in its own right, but also um, bring to light this very, uh, up until now, pretty relatively unexplored moment of, of medical history. Before we talk about the characters, I'd love to talk about your research process, Mm -hmm. Uh, because once you sort of developed that interest and you found this new rabbit hole, what sort of sources did you look at? Um, And in terms of crafting uh, Josephine as a, you know, as a point of view character or like somebody who you see, uh, you know, very closely, um, did you base her on any real accounts? Is she one woman you encountered or is she a composite of several accounts that you looked at? Like what sort, what, what went into your research? Um, I, the research, uh, thankfully this is something that there's a fair amount of um, academic information on. I mean, a lot of people have been very interested in this particular period of history. Um, and, you know, it's also in particular, I think, because it um, it sort of led directly in many people's minds to the modern day um, area of psychoanalysis. I mean, Freud had not been planning on studying hysteria. I think he'd been planning on going into clinical practice before he went to the Salpetri, and he just became so enamored of Charcot and fascinated by hysteria that he just completely pivoted and went, you know, started studying hysteria. And when he left the Salpetri, he began writing papers about hysteria and um, began exploring different ways to interact with hysterics to sort of help them. And that actually eventually led to, to what we, you know, he called talk therapy, um, mm-hmm. which is basically modern day psychoanalysis. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of people sort of examining this particular moment because there's so much interest in Freud still. Um, and, um, you know, there's also a lot of, uh, there's a, a growing, well, there were actually, there was a fair amount of material in English um, about the phenomenon of hysteria and these women at the self and sort of how they were monitored and documented and treated. Uh, a lot of academic articles, um, one very excellent um, book as well um, called uh, Medical Muses, which was published, I believe, in like 19... 19- 83 I forget I forget when but um that was super helpful it was um uh Siri Hustavet wrote that and it she went into the um sort of uh sort of records at the Salpetri and sort of was able to really access a lot of medical documentation these doctors would 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 really they didn't do an awful lot to treat these women, but they did study them and write about them a lot and sort of took meticulous notes about what they were hearing, what they were seeing. And those records are still at the Salpetria. So, I mean, I was able to also affirm that through independent research, but um, she does a marvelous job, I think, of, of talking about the very specific cases and some of the, the hysterics in particular who became really famous in their own right, because they were featured by Charcot and, and in um, both on stage and in, in numerous um, papers that he wrote. Um, and yeah, there were other sort of um, lots and lots of material on Charcot. I feel like I've now read, you know, met when I talk about this subject, I'll, I've, I've now had at least two people tell me that they did, you know, a, a PhD dissertation on Charcot, or I, you know, I just, I just came back from a college reunion and someone had done her whole, you know, um, graduate, uh, or actually a uh, baccalaureate, you know, pre-graduate degree on sort of hysteria and the male medical establishment. So there was a lot on on him and and on his acolytes. Um, so, you know, that was also pretty fascinating and pretty easy to access. Um, and in terms of like how Josephine came to, came to be, I, it was interesting because I was also, I sort of knew once I became somewhat familiar with this, with this world, it felt very Gothic to me. It had a very Brontean feel. And I was interested in trying to kind of merge a classical Gothic storyline with this incredibly compelling and strange material that I was discovering through research. Um, And so I sort of created her in part thinking about, you know, heroines from Gothic novels that I really, you know, love and have loved and, and went back and sort of revisited for this. Uh, Laura was also very much informed, you know, by by Jane Eyre, for instance, you know, sort of the bookish, um, you know, narrator 
who kind of is your is your stalwart guide to you know some very strange happenings. Um, but I think while Josephine was really a composite, because a lot of the experiments that I sort of have her undergoing happened to a variety of women. Um, she also was largely drawn, I'd say, from Augustine Glaze, who was the um, a very young hysteric who came into the Salpetri at age 14, was, I think one of the descriptions in the, the by one of the doctors was that she wasn't a classic beauty like Blanche Whitman, who was really perhaps the most famous of the, the Salpetri hysterics, mm -hmm. but she was incredibly um, photo photogenic. So, you know, if you go online and you look her up, you'll just see these these very striking images of her um, supposedly that hypnotized her and were putting her through these hysterical phases. And so she was, you know, I won't say performing because that's a tricky word, but was experiencing these hysterical um, episodes in front of the camera and doing it just with almost like a theatrical grace that was really amazing. So I kind of pulled that aspect of Josephine that she's very hypnotizable because that was one of the real um, requirements that that Charcot had for his hysterics. He actually believed that only hysterics could be hypnotized. So if you were able to be hypnotized in his mind, you were a hysteric. Um, there was a lot of debate about that. There were different schools of thought, but that was he was very firmly convinced of that. Um, and then she's, you know, just this very sort of magne magnetic, charismatic, um, you know, quality that led her to be extremely compelling to to watch as she went through these phases of her illness, um, which uh, you know can be looked at in a number of ways. Obviously, I think the male medical establishment saw it as a as a great opportunity to kind of draw attention to their theories on hysteria mm -hmm. um, because it was very hard to look away from her. Um, but I think that that she also used her clearly used her magnetism and her power because it was a kind of power to draw attention to her what she wanted to say what she was going through she sort of demanded to be seen mm -hmm. and um that was another quality that i felt that that i wanted to imbue josephine with that she was someone who would not be looked over who would not just accept what was being thrust on her by life but you know was was absolutely going to give as good as she took and um and be heard mm. I love how you phrased that about um you know her need to yeah state her case and be seen and sort of not let you look away right. um, because it really reminds me of you know I studied a little bit of the history of medicine as part of my PhD. I was a medieval historian. So this oh, is wow. the time period. <laughs> but when you're learning the medieval, they always take you to the eight, the 19th century to see where things end up, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, what really, really stuck out to me was that one of the most, you know, foundational things I learned was that we view medicine as a an objective science, you know, but it actually happens through the eyes of people who have biases and perspectives and, and like assumptions. And it really, I think, shows you how, uh, you know, hysteria in a weird way sort of like just pathologizes uh, refusing to be invisible in a way, you know, mm -hmm. and sort of like female behavior that wasn't acceptable or pretty or polite or, you know, passive uh could be pathologized under this sort of like ever widening umbrella term you know yes exactly and so I really love that like you know she flies in the face of that like it really shows you that medicine is not just an objective science but like a a tool of social control you know and so is that was yeah. something that was on your mind when you were writing or oh very very much very mm -hmm. much I mean and that's also you know it sort of makes me think about that we call it you know the medical arts you know for a reason, because it, it is an art, you know, it's, it's a way of, it's a mode of interpreting. And part of what was so fascinating to me was to sort of see how, how much amazing progress was being made in the sciences and even made in, in, you know, in terms of sort of the treatment of people in asylums. Um, you know, I think if you'd gone back 150 years earlier before Philippe Pinel showed up at the Salpetriere and sort of famously humanized it, you know, you, they, you had, the inmates, they're really being treated like prisoners, um, you know, chained to the walls and dressed in rags and ignored and guarded by dogs. And um, and, and Pinnell was, you know, um, I think rightly lauded for 
taking away the manacles mostly, you know, and, um, you know, trying to create a, a world in which these people could live some sort of a, a gratifying life as opposed to simply be sort of disposed of by society. Um, uh, but you, you know, you also had just these incredibly outdated mindsets and thoughts that were happening. I mean, these, these two things were sort of going hand in hand. You were, you were hurtling towards the advent of the x-ray. You know, Blanche Whitman actually ended up working in the radiology department. Um, you know, after, uh, sh after Charcot died, she was miraculously cured of her hysteria and, um, and then became like a worker as many, as many, you know, sort of ex-inmates did, ex-patients uh, did um, in the, in the radiology department. She ended up working with Marie Curie um, and actually like Curie dying of, of uh, radiation poisoning, unfortunately. Um, but then you had, you know, you still had doctors who were, were at, you know, fully convinced that the hysteria was caused as Sophocles had sort of famously said, you know, a millennia earlier by the uterus wandering around the body. I mean, people really, yeah. <laughs> really believe that. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think a lot, even after they sort of stopped believing that they still sort of held on to a lot of the tenets that sort of sprung out of that that bizarre theory, which was that you needed to be pregnant to be a healthy, fully functioning woman. You had to be sort of rooted. Your uterus had to be rooted. You had to be doing what your body was supposedly built to do. The one thing you were actually built to do. And if you weren't doing that, then you were really susceptible to this terrible illness. Mm -hmm. um, so that was part of what was really fascinating to me as well, that, you know, you had this sort of dichotomy. And, and it also makes you sort of wonder, we consider ourselves to be so firmly advanced now. And yet, even as we sort of, you know, um, make incredible breakthroughs on so many areas of, of medicine, including in mental health, you know, which is much more nuanced now. And I think much more openly discussed. Um, I'm sure in a hundred years, people will look back and just be shocked by the barbarism and, you know, the sort of ignorance that, you know, is, um, is also, um, you know, a big part of the, you know, the process right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I would love for you to talk a little bit about uh, Josephine's amnesia. Um, mm -hmm. Because I love, I love uh, how it functions in this. Like it creates really great stakes, right? Because um, for both uh, Josephine and Lore are both super driven to try to recover uh, these memories, you know, that are are currently hidden. But the stakes of also uncovering that history <laughs> is also like potentially uh, disastrous, you know. And so it's right. it's sort of immediately a damned if you do, damned if you don't <laughs> situation that both right women are in and it's so interesting and I'm wondering when you are writing amnesia um did you start out I hope I phrase this in a way that makes sense did you start out with a clear portrait of what was being obscured or did the did the hidden past reveal itself as you wrote her in the present does that make sense yeah no it does make sense and I had I started out with amnesia you know I, I knew that I wanted Josephine to have amnesia when she came in just because it's such a mysterious condition and I wanted her to be a really fully mysterious heroine whose backstory you really didn't know um but uh I didn't have a full understanding of what that amnesia was really covering up for the entire book I think the more I wrote I think I started out with her trying to hide maybe you know a, a single a single act you know um it wasn't as deliberate. It was much more passive mm. in my mind. And then, but frankly, the, this is one of those books that the more I, I wrote and researched, the angrier I got. And I, I that, which I think perhaps comes out a little bit in the writing. It's not a, a necessarily fun book to read, but there's it's very passionate. Um, and I just decided to make her much more active. Um, I'm not going to sort of give away the big reveal, but I, I sort of didn't want her to, I mean, her whole, the whole point of, of this was that I, these women were not passive they were active in the only way that was really allowed to them and I really wanted her to kind of embody that kind of activism and that um sort of self-affirmation so I created a much more elaborate and um dramatic backstory as I went that um you know actually in the end was was much more satisfying to me to sort of uncover and I I do love I mean the whole damned if you do damned if you don't I mean that is just absolutely fantastic fiction <laughs> Potter. I mean, it's, it's what, you know, what writers 
try to do because that, you know, that keeps readers on the edge of their seat. Like, how are they going to get out of this? Um, Oh gosh. Absolutely. (laughs) I, uh, it's just, it's, yeah, it's like, it's, 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 it's weird because it's not a fun read, but also it is like, it's propulsive, you know, (laughs) and it's, 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 the, the tension is just strung along in a way that is like, absolutely just makes it compulsively readable. And it really does give you, um, I think a, a, a really, a really vivid insight into a really important moment of medical history that affects mm-hmm. how we see mental illness and mental health today, you know, and how we view women's behavior today. And, you know, it's just all really interesting to see that explored in a, in, in such a, engaging way. So thank you so much for writing this and for joining us. It was very much, very much my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. Are you, Um, I know it's hard sometimes for writers to talk about this, but are, is there anything in the works right now? Yeah, I, I'm, I have a sort of general idea of what I'd like to try to, the general subject that I'd like to try to work on. Um, it's one that actually has sort of personal relevance to me, actually, I guess all of them do. I mean, this one certainly, I would say Mad Women in its own way had a lot of relevance to, I think, any woman <laughs> living today. Um, but I haven't quite figured out the setting yet. I sort of started out thinking I was going to do it as another classical historical novel set in Spain under Franco. Ooh. And then I started the research and I had almost visceral response because I I don't think I can do another you know deep dive research book Next, I've done four in a row, and I sort of felt okay. It's time for me to to try something else. So then I was trying to set it as a dystopian sort of future story, but that wasn't quite working, and also was was depressing. Um, and I didn't want to spend you know the next three years in a depressive place. So I think I might set some set it more in the seventies and sort of the the rock and roll world um, of women rockers, you know, and women folk singers in the nineteen seventies. So that's that's what I think. I'm going to be sort of diving into next. We'll see. It's open, open to discussion. So. Oh, that's very exciting. Well, I hope that you know, whatever form the project takes, I hope you'll consider coming back to the show because it was great talking about this book and I can't wait to see what you do next. <laughs> I, I I would love to come back. I love the Syasa Library. So it's it's one of my favorite places. So I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to, to return whenever you want me. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, please pick up The Mad Women of Paris. It is an absolutely essential read I think this summer and I it's it's just it's going to be one of my favorite books of the year I already know it by the time that you oh, by the time that you hear this uh it'll be available so please go to your favorite independent bookstore or library wherever you like to get your books thank you so much for joining us it is now time to close this chapter it's time to close this chapter of turn the page join us for the next episode